so since it's uh, 2 p.m. sharp, uh, I want to say good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, it's really that uh, people are coming from all over the world, uh, and we are covering uh, literally all time zones. Um, my name is Anna Babovic, and I'm the executive director of the Leading Change Network. And I have this huge pleasure, uh, really, to welcome you all on behalf of the Leading Change Network leadership team, Matt Wan, uh, Rowan Zane, uh, and myself to our relaunch event. Uh, today, uh, we have registered more than uh, 300 people from 42 countries, and on this slide you actually see uh, all uh, the countries that people have registered from, uh, and you will also see that we are covering all six uh, continents, which is of course a great thing. Um, today we will actually have a two uh, and a half hours event, uh, where you will have the opportunity to participate in a thought-provoking panel uh, of Professor Marshall Gaines, um, Professor Harry Hahn, uh, and uh, the panel will be uh, moderated by our dear uh, Art Reyes III. Um, after that, you'll have the opportunity to actually listen to the presentations and participate in discussions with 12 amazing practitioners from all around the world um, on four different topics that we, that we found the most relevant at the moment. Um, we'll also have the opportunity to meet and have one one, one with other participants uh, in the event and at the end you'll have the opportunity to uh, hear about LCN plans for the relaunch, our membership program, our community of practice and of course our new website that we are very proud of. Um, now before we start uh, with, uh, with the rest of the program let me just quickly say a few words about the LCN. So um, Leading Change Network is rooted in community organizing, social movement, and civic traditions, and has actually grew out of the work of Professor Malian, uh, his collaborators, their students, and others. Um, organizing became Marshall's calling after his experience in Mississippi Summer Project, for which he dropped out of Harvard. Uh, and after 28 years of actually organizing communities, unions, and electoral campaigns, Marshall returned to Harvard to complete his formal education, and he also there developed uh, an organizing course, luckily for all of us. Um, although on the faculty uh, since, since 2000, Marshall was joined by the, the campaign for Howarding for President, um, but then it, uh, it moved to uh, working with Sierra Club uh, in establishing their groups and also launching Camp Obama's uh, to organize volunteers in Obama's campaign 2007-8. Um, after Obama's campaign, interest actually in this method uh, emerged in different fields like education and healthcare, environment and immigration movement, um, and all that uh, in collaboration with New Organizing Institute and Institute for Health Improvement. Um, and at the same time, uh, in 2010, uh, Marshall launched his online class at Harvard, um, while his students from both uh, uh, online and on the ground class, as well as his collaborators, started to actually adapt the organizing pedagogy in communities around the world. Um, and this is, actually, this is actually how the idea of LCN emerged. Um, all these leaders in organizing research and education um, had identified the need for a global community of practice that will then enable them to learn from one another, to improve their practice, uh, and of course, to engage others in, in, uh, in this work. And that's actually approximately when I started to learn about the LCN idea as well. Uh, my first encounter of the LCN goes back to 2012. Um, and at that time, I was actually working in the government of Serbia as advisor to the deputy prime minister. It was very fancy and very, uh, very convinced that I'm doing very serious work. Um, and uh, at that time, I also spent uh, all my free time doing the organizing work with Serbia on the Move, um, which is a change-making nonprofit that I co-founded with several uh, of my friends a few years before that. So in July 2012, I got invitation to join LCN founding conference, uh, and I remember entering the room full of people who were jumping from chairs to greet each other, fascinated to see each other in three dimensions, uh, after actually a long time working uh, and knowing each other online. Um, the event started by each participant standing up to share their name, where they call home, and what they do. Um, and at that time, my English wasn't really uh, uh, good, and I also hated standing up and introducing myself. So I was rushing to finish as soon as I could, uh, and, they only, and only when I sat back, um, I actually realized that I introduced myself but saying what I do for a living and what I actually 
what my real passion is, which is organizing with Serbia on the Move. And it was actually the first time in my life where I actually realized that discrepancy. Um, the conference started, and unlike any other conference that I was participant before, um, this one was actually led by participants. Um, and there I met Nisreen and Rowan, um, and Nicole and I were leading the, the, the session, uh, one session on the agenda, uh, for which we prepared for almost three, month, two, three months before. And I also met Art Reyes and Wing and Jake Boxman and Dan Grandoni and Chris Torres and Stephanie Ames. And all of them are my very good friends now. But at that time, I actually got inspired by hearing their stories, by learning from their campaigns, by sharing about, you know, like challenges that they are facing on the ground, actually by realizing that those challenges that they are facing are the same challenges that we are facing in Serbia, although we thought that it's only because Serbs are the way they are. So the whole energy actually reminded me of how much, uh, uh, reminded me a lot of my teenage days, um, which were marked with protests and marches against the regime of Slobodan Milosevic during NATO bombing. So every day, right at 7.30 p.m., street lights would shut down, war sirens would warn us to uh, stay in the basements and not to go out. But my parents, my neighbors, my friends, uh, all of us would dress up and hit the streets of Belgrade to show the protest against the regime. And despite the fact that bombs were falling like a rain, more and more people were protesting on the streets every day. And then virtually Milosevic fell. And... That was actually the first time when I realized the power of organized people. So that feeling sitting back in the LCM conference, um, that feeling of people's power made me realize on the other hand that my work in the government doesn't have anything to do with people anymore. And that the impact that I was making with organizing with Serbia on the move was much actually larger than the input that I was making in the government. So the elephant was there in the middle of the room and the choice was very clear. Um, I could stay in the government and do some useless work um, and pretend that I was important, uh, or I could actually quit and commit to organizing uh, 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 and do work with Serbia on the move and create some real change. Um, I spent that night uh, talking about the challenge with uh, my best friend, Peja Stojcic. And on the day after, at the last session of the conference, Marshall publicly asked me if I wanted to share something. Um, and I stood up uh, shaking more than the first day um, and trembling actually in uncertainty. Um, and then I announced that I'll quit my job and commit my, uh, my work uh, to Serbia on the move full time. Um, and the applause of support broke through the room. Um, and it was actually the scariest decision I made in my life. Um, but now I can tell you also that it was the best one. Um, it brought me to the work of creating real change on the ground. It allowed me to build my leadership skills and support leadership of others. Um, and the most important thing, it gave me the opportunity to, through LCN, become a part of a community of passionate people from all around the world who are really committed to making positive change in their societies. So now um, everyone is aware that the world today is facing growing challenges to democracy that nationalism in Europe and around the world is on the rise. We had Trump's uh, uh, being elected in, uh, in the US, we have Bolsonaro in Brazil. I don't want to even mention regimes in Hungary, Turkey and elsewhere. And actually right-wing uh, right politics is getting more and more organized and is getting more and, uh, is getting more, and more support. Um, people are trying to resist, to oppose uh, and to change something. Um, and that sometimes um, uh, going well, sometimes doesn't. But one thing is that every day someone reaches out to Professor Gaines or some other member of the network in search for training, coaching, advice. People are actually asking for support in building the leadership capacity that is needed for this work on the ground. So we listen to those requests and we listen to our constituency, and then we decided actually to relaunch LCN um, as an organized effort to develop leadership with depth, diversity, and skills uh, for building power, organizing action, and creating change, to improve organizing practices through shared learning, adaptation, and development, and finally, to build on-the-ground capacity in diverse communities uh, where uh, it's most needed. So now, uh, as organizers already know, we started with building the foundation. Uh, since August, uh, Matt, Rowan, and I started 
you know, like putting pieces together uh, in order for us to relaunch the organization and to build every, and to create the whole scaffolding that is needed. Um, and today is our first peak. Uh, it's actually our kickoff. Um, and um, we'll have more than 300 people in this event from uh, so many different countries and continents. Um, I'm, uh, I, I can tell you how excited I am to know that, you know, like people in Australia are joining us uh, at 3 a.m. Uh, people in New Zealand are not <laughs> not having a better uh, better time zone as well. Um, we have people who uh, are 12 presenters who met several times to prepare for their breakout discussions. Uh, Harry Khan stepped out from the family gathering to join us for a keynote discussion. Um, and I know that all of you sacrifice your Sunday brunches or family gatherings or at least relax Sunday evenings uh, together today with us uh, and uh, with all comrades uh, from around the world. Um, so we know this is just the beginning of our future together, uh, but it really gives me hope that LCN is not alone in its desire to turn the current challenges into opportunities and that we have the community that will actually join us uh, on this mission. So we hope um, uh, those who are not yet members of our um, community uh, will become uh, ones very soon. Um, so let me now just uh, turn into uh, actually what the, this whole event is about, uh, into our uh, keynote uh, discussion after which uh, we will follow with breakout rooms and then relation, uh, relational meetings. Um, at the very beginning, I want to say that the topic of our keynote uh, is uh, the role of organizing and mobilizing in the world today. Um, and I have a great pleasure to welcome our three dear uh, speakers uh, uh, for, for this occasion. Um, our first keynote speaker is Professor Marshall Gens. Um, I already uh, sh shared a little bit about uh, him and majority of you already uh, know Professor really well. Um, but I uh, really want to say that uh, majority of this work uh, started with Professor Gens. Uh, not, he, doesn't, he doesn't say that he invented organizing, but definitely thinking about how to, uh, how to uh, actually combine years of experience uh, that he uh, had working on the ground with communities, unions, and electoral campaigns, and turn it actually into the pedagogy that um, we can all uh, learn from, but also pass on to uh, our communities uh, is uh, very important. Professor uh, is now a senior lecturer at Harvard Kennedy School, um, and I can, uh, from my experience, say that um, that's the class that uh, can never receive all students who want to take it, uh, and that's always a challenge of its kind. Um, so thank you, Professor, for, for joining us uh, for this event. Um, our second speaker um, is, uh, keynote speaker is Professor Harry Khan, um, and Harry is Professor of Political Science and Environmental Politics at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, she specializes in the study of civic and political participation, collective action, organizing, and social change, um, and particularly as it pertains to social policy, environment, uh, environmental issues uh, and democratic re revitalization. She published, three, she published three books, um, How Organizations Developed Activists, Groundbreakers, How Obama's uh, 2.2 Million Volunteers Transform, Transformed Campaigning uh, in America, and um, Move to Action, Motivation, Participation, and Inequality in American Politics. Uh, her work is award-winning and has been published in numerous uh, prestigious journals and other outlets. Uh, and last, but definitely not the least, is our moderator for today's uh, keynote. Um, it's uh, Art Reyes III. Um, Art is... Um, yeah, I wanted to say dear friend, but that would be true for whoever we introduced today. Um, but it's also a founding uh, executive director of We the People. Uh, he was born and raised in Flint, Michigan. Um, and uh, he hails from the three generations of proud union members. Um, before We the People, Art was training director at the Center for Popular Democracy, where he actually led national training programs for organizers, lead staff, and executive directors. Uh, he spent much of 2016 working in Flint, responding to the water crisis, uh, and helped launch uh, Flint Rising. Um, and he also had um, a BA in Michigan and an MVP from Harvard. Uh, he taught with Professor Gaines uh, as well. So now, let me turn the microphone to our trace who will uh, start with um, moving us to the discussion.
Art, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. And welcome, folks. I'm so excited to see so many familiar faces and a lot of new faces from all across the globe. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night for some folks. <laughs> Uh, you know, really, really appreciate everybody making the time to be um, on on this important event. So, again, my name my name is Art Reyes. I'm very excited to be moderating our our opening conversation. And before I dive into that, I just want to say a big word of gra gratitude to Anna uh, that um, as someone who has served uh, on the board and chaired the board of LCN and been part of advisory board over the past number of years. Just very, very grateful for Anna's leadership um, and all that she's been doing to really build this community and pull this community together. Um, it is one that I have found to be a very important one and very, very excited for this big public relaunch. Um, the moment that Anna described in her story of coming back uh, and publicly announcing for the first time that she was an organizer uh, and was dedicating her career to that, I remember it very well. It was actually, it was my birthday. And I remember sitting, sitting next to her there. Um, so. Uh, really, really appreciate your recollections on that. Um, very excited to dive into, into this panel. Uh, again, my name is Art. I'm the executive director of an organization called We the People, which is working to build multiracial working class organizing infrastructure across the state of Michigan. Uh, Michigan is home for me. I grew up in, in Flint. Uh, I, um, my family came to Flint in the 1940s and 50s as migrant workers from Texas. Uh, and for, for my family, Flint at one point was very much a beacon of hope for working people. Uh, it was a place where my family came in search of good union jobs and stability for our family. Uh, my great grandmother, who was one of the women who helped to raise me, would tell me stories of what it was like for her growing up in a small segregated town in Texas where there were signs on some restaurants that said no Mexicans and no dogs. But she would tell me, Mijito, you're an American first, which was her way of telling me this country was just as much mine as it was anyone else's. Um, but that, 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 that sentiment is something that has to be fought for. Uh, and I learned that growing up and over the course of my career as an organizer, uh, that uh, actually building power for our people is not something that just happens. It's something that we have to constantly work and fight for. Uh, and in the moment that we're in right now in the United States and globally, as Anna discussed a little bit earlier, uh, there are many of our democratic institutions and people's institutions that are under pretty significant assault. Um, we're seeing a lot of very real challenges um, in, in a number of societies across the globe uh, that, that threaten democratic institutions. And so we're very excited to be having a conversation today about what it looks like uh, and what it means uh, to, to, to respond to the face of that adversity with people power, with organizing, and with movements. So very honored to be having this conversation with two very close friends, with, with Hari and with Marshall. Um, and I'm just going to tee it up with an opening question. I'm going to kick it off, and Hari will share a little bit of her thoughts first. Uh, Marshall will then share some of his thoughts, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, and, and have a good chunk of time, 15 or 20 minutes for discussion and questions. So uh, just the, the kind of question that I, that I wanna pose with this is, is both in the, in the US and across the globe, as we just talked about, we're seeing a, a significant amount of attacks on democracy and we're facing significant challenges uh, across the globe. But we wanna ask the question, why is organizing in this moment particularly important? And why is organizing, uh, uh, it, uh, wh wh why not sim simply mobilizing people? Why is that insufficient? Why do we have to organize in this in this particular moment? So I'm going to kick it off to Hari first uh, to introduce herself and share some of her thoughts, and then we'll go to Marshall, and then we'll have some discussion. So Hari, please take it away. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Art, for um, that really kind introduction, and also to Anna for um, teeing it up and setting everything up so well. Um, I'm really excited to um, have the opportunity to have this discussion um, with Marshall and with all of you. Um, so I am calling in right now from um, Santa Barbara, California, which is where I live now. I'm a professor at the university here, um, but it's not where I started. Um, as um, you know, many of you who are here um, have probably heard bits of this story before, but, you know, so I grew up in Texas as the daughter of Korean immigrants, and um, my parents first immigrated to the United States in the early 1970s when Korea was still a developing economy. So a lot of what I saw over the course of my life um, as my parents, as I was growing up, is sort of the struggle that my parents had to figure out 
um, A, like, what does it mean to raise kids in the United States? You know, like, who are we if we're not American and we're not Korean and we're something in between, you know, and this sort of struggle to figure out um, that sense out of what that meant. But then secondly, also, it was just sort of a material struggle. Um, you know, they came to the United States with a sort of proverbial hundred dollars in their pockets. And um, over the course of my life, I saw my parents kind of really try to um, build their lives here. And so, even though I grew up in this family that was super apolitical, like it wasn't something that we talked about and our experiences weren't really politicized for us in any way. Um, you know, I sort of discovered organizing when I went to college, I did my undergraduate work at Harvard and um, got really involved in some student activism there and sort of happened upon Marshall's class class because I was trying to find a way. <laughs> so it turned out that I ended up in this great class. Um, and I actually recently had a um, Harvard undergraduate reach out to me because she was doing um, some undergraduate research on student activism in the 1990s and she had come across an op-ed that I had written in the student newspaper um, articulating my reasons for um, you know taking a stance against the administration <laughs> on certain things that they were doing. Um, and you know I was at first I was sort of dismayed that I'd become a relic of history but um, Second, it sort of made me realize like how much of the work that I do now was informed by what I learned at that time when I was a student, you know, and um, the opportunity that Marshall's class had given me to sort of really put a lot of, not only the work that I was doing as, an, as um, a leader, as a student leader in college into context, but also to sort of give me a framework for kind of really understanding a lot of experience that experiences that I had growing up as a child of immigrants in Texas and sort of struggling to sort of figure out that sense of um, who I wanted to be in this world. So um, fast forward, you know, so now what I do is um, I, I teach and I research on organizing. Um, I do work that's in partnership with a lot of groups in the field. And um, to Art's question, you know, I have to say, as I was thinking about, um, as I was thinking about this conversation that we're going to have, and I was, as I was thinking about the question, um, it sort of struck me that, in some ways, like I don't know that I see any way out of the problem that we're in right now, except for organizing, right? As I look, I mean, I'm most familiar with the United States, but as I look around, the sort of struggles that we're having around um, belonging, you know, who belongs, who doesn't belong, how do we construct the community that we want to be in, um, how do we give voice? to people so that they can exercise power over the outcomes that they actually care about in their own lives? Um, how do we wrest power away from corporations and create an alternative um, way of practicing democracy that doesn't just um, shift power over to corporations? Um, you know, all, you know, how do we deal with partisan polarization? Like a lot of the sort of debates that I feel like we're having right now, in some ways, what underlies them is this um, decline in our ability to um, create power in the ways that we relate to each other, you know, and um, I remember, I don't know if, um, you know, if you all remember in the, um, in the lead up to the 2016 election, the summer um, of, in, of that moment, right, there was this moment where we had a big shooting in the United States um, in Orlando, Florida, and then there was a shooting of a police officer in Dallas, and the shooting of a another unarmed black man in Minnesota. And, and, you know, there was sort of this kind of like moment at that summer where the campaign was going on. It felt like the country was sort of spasming in a different, in, in a lot of different ways. And um, in my moments of despair, as I often do, I reached out to Marshall and I said, you know, like, what, how do we think about this? Like, does this feel to you like it felt in 1968, you know, when, you know, it was, it was that civil rights movement, it was this moment, like all this stuff was going on. And I remember one thing that Marshall said that has really stuck with me is he said, you know, in some ways that, that sense of the country spasming feels very similar, but what feels different is in 1968, it felt like we had leadership that could help us see our way out. And now it feels like we don't have that leadership, you know, and, and that's where I see the sort of opportunity and need for organizing being so urgent right now is that I think a lot of people are, are recognized the problems that we have with democracy, not only in the United States and around the world, but are searching for that leadership, that way to sort of navigate um, the uncertain moment that we're in right now. And organizers, I think, have the, the best answer for it. And the reason is, is because, you know, in this moment where there's so much uncertainty and everyone's fighting for legitimacy, you know, any effort to just sort of 
um, you know, mobilize people really thinly without getting into that depth of the set of questions about who we are, who we want to be in that in this world, how we sort of cho make choices to stand together and to find the courage to take those stands and then to stick together over time in the face of assaults on our own power. I don't think um, that happens without the kind of organizing that we're talking about here. And um, the one last thing before I'll say before I stop is that, you know, I always think about, you know, I had to struggle throughout my career to sort of decide whether or not I wanted to stay in academia or go back and work in organizing. And I ultimately decided to stay in um, academia because I feel really strongly that um, the capacity to learn and the sort of constant, um, the instantiation of sort of dynamic learning processes is so fundamental to what makes organizing work. And I think that's one place where being a researcher can really help. And part of what I feel like is so unique about the community is the way in which it brings together that learning and the teaching and the practice um, all together um, that, that just doesn't exist in most other places. And, you know, this was really reinforced to me recently with the research project that I've been doing with Liz McKenna, who a lot of you know, and Michelle Oyakawa, who's another um, scholar um, um, organizer. And we were, we were looking around the United States and sort of saying, you know, if you look around the United States right now, one of the biggest problems is the, the kind of broken link between participation and power, right? Just because people take action, it doesn't mean their actions are going to translate into power. And so what if we looked around and tried to identify places that broke that trend, right? Where there are actually places where ordinary people came together and they exercised um, actual power over outcomes that they care about, what will we see in common? So we sort of set up this project. <laughs> Set up this project and we sort of went around and kind of researched these and you know honestly when we first went in we sort of thought like maybe there'd be like one governance structure that we're going to find like all of these organizations have a certain way of electing leaders or maybe there's going to be one deliberative process you know or maybe there'll be sort of one school of like leadership development that all these organizers will have come out of and we didn't find that at all like there wasn't sort of you know, what really underscored for me is that there wasn't any kind of one formula to what these organizations were doing, but what they were really doing was they were deeply invested in learning and they had a deep sense of the urgency about the work that they were doing, right? So that caused them to sort of be in this constant cycle of dynamic learning and innovation that made them figure out like, gosh, just because we did this one thing, we haven't gotten the power that we want. So what do we do next? And there was that constant sort of dynamism and that strategy that really sort of unified these organizations. And so to me, it just sort of brings me back to what makes LCN so unique because it brings that um, those three, those circles and those domains of work um, all together in a really unique way. So I probably went on too long, but I'll pause now and um, thank you very much for um, the opportunity to have this conversation. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Hari. Uh, let's, we're going to kick it over to, to Marshall now. Thanks, Art, and, uh, and thanks, Hari. Uh, is this working? Everybody here? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, well, it's great to see everyone. And uh, first, I really want to thank Anna and Matt, Bawan, their team, for, for getting this whole thing up and running. Uh, you know, I don't know, I think in our distance learning class, we discovered that you can applaud on Zoom at the same time. So, I don't know, I want to propose unmute for a moment and let's give them a big applause for the work. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. It takes, it takes a little more practice to do the unity applause on Zoom, but it can be learned, and uh, that's, that's cool. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, really the first place outside the U.S. where this really began to take root uh, was in Jordan. I want to acknowledge Nisreen's leadership with initiating AHEL, which in so many ways set an example of how we could develop something that was transnational, uh, not just limited by national boundaries, adapted uh, to different realities and circumstances. I also want to acknowledge uh, Jennifer McRae's contribution uh, in providing leadership to develop the initial resources to get this going, uh, because uh, without that support, 
we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing this. So it's important that we recognize all that. Okay, uh, uh, democracy. Well, there's a small <laughs> a small topic for a few minutes. I, you know, one of the for me one of the privileges or gifts that uh, that I have through teaching has been an opportunity to have a conversation with the future, which is what it feels like when I go to class every week. It's this kind of cross-generational uh, pedagogical conversation. Uh, and what I discovered through the distance learning class and through LCN is the opportunity to have a conversation, a global conversation. Because to me, that's, that's where our future lies. Uh, and unless we can learn with and from each other, then we wound up falling into the traps of fear and isolation and anger and hate that we see blossoming uh, in different places. Blossom is probably the wrong word for that uh, around the world. So um, I, I just want to say that this is a very rich opportunity for that kind of learning and that kind of engagement and growing. Uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, scholars from whom I learned, uh, Sid Verba, once described democracy as a, uh, as a hypothesis, a possibility that um, equal voice could balance unequal resources. In other words, that, that there could be a political mechanism through uh, the exercise of equal voice could balance the unequal concentration of private wealth or private resources. And that's a huge test. And I think we've been going backwards on that in a lot of parts of the world. And it's one of the reasons we have such a challenge right now. Um, but I also think that, and, and to a great extent, the power of equal voice is amplified or is experienced uh, in democratic arrangements only through collective action. You know, it's, it's through the, the power of numbers that it becomes possible to ex exercise that kind of power. And because when people associate with each other, they learn about common interests, not just their individual self-interest. They develop uh, uh, relationships that become foundational to solidarity, to supporting one another, and they learn how to govern themselves. They learn basic democratic skills and practices. This was one of the Tocqueville's observations about the significance of organization. Now today, we're dealing with a combination of forces that uh, have been translating us into sort of um, units of data and sort of individual units of data rather than human beings engaged with each other in relationship. And so what we've seen through a lot of the mobilizing that's been going on, and Zainab Tufeci's uh, book on uh, Twitter and tear gas is a wonderful account of all this, studying mobilizations around the world, is that aggregating individuals, you know, uh, we all click a mouse at the same time, or we all show up at the same time, isn't the same thing as creating collective capacity, that is linking people to each other, so that we can begin to create holes that are greater than the sum of its parts. You know, markets work fine on the aggregation model, that is when they're well-controlled markets, but that's what they're about, individuals enter and exit whenever they want based on their preferences. Democracy requires the engagement of people with each other in committed relationships in which they can do the work to discern their common interests, to develop their collective power, and to be able to turn that power into political power, economic power, and cultural, uh, cultural influence. So to me, organizing is about that. Uh, mobilizing is about the same thing we hear from, you know, the market world, just, you know, turn out and go away. I, I don't know, if I go to another march where you, you say, what happens next? And people say, well, I don't know. Or there's nobody collecting names. I mean, that's a sure sign. So this sounds like so basic and fundamental, but uh, I think these questions are. And the problem is that if we don't connect with one another and build these committed communities to making this kind of learning and change and power, then we leave the space open to the merchants of hate as opposed, to the, as opposed to the advocates of hope. Because as human beings, we're relational creatures. That's how we operate, that's, that's what we are. 
And if we grind down all the mechanisms and institutions through which we build relationships, then we create a kind of pathological situation in which we turn in any direction. And so there's a big difference between mobilizing people to act together out of hope and a big difference between that and mobilizing people to act together out of fear. And I think the United States is getting a long overdue lesson in humility uh, by experiencing the Trump regime for the last two years and the shame of having allowed that to happen. Uh, and I think that one of the encouraging things from the recent election is that, that it's not enough to think in terms of resistance. Michelle Alexander wrote a wonderful piece in the New York Times uh, uh, about a month ago where she said, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not the resistance, they are. They're resisting the future. They're resisting the new America, the new world that's trying to be born. And they're using whatever mechanisms of power they can lay their hands on to do that. But let's be clear, the wind is in our sails, not theirs. But that means we have to fight to claim it. Uh, and uh, she also said in the civil rights movement, the song wasn't, we shall resist, it was, we shall overcome. And I think that's the kind of spirit that we have to bring to the work that we have to do uh, throughout the world. So uh, let's just open this up for conversation, uh, which uh, I'm looking very much forward to. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hari and, and Marshall, uh, for diving into that. So just a couple of quick things to note. So folks with questions, please feel free to chime into the chat or unmute yourself uh, to ask a question. I know just to kick it off, there was a little bit of discussion that was happening, Hari and Marshall, while you were talking uh, about uh, moments of intense mobilization. We're seeing it right now in France. We certainly saw some of that happening with Occupy, with the Arab Spring. Uh, and so some of those questions were getting raised around mobilization and the need for leadership in those moments. So while we're asking folks to begin thinking about questions on the chat or chiming in, let's start off with any reflections, Marshall or Hari, that you might have uh, on, on, on that. Well, we had an interesting panel last year with Wael Gonim, who was the Google guy uh, in Takar Square, along with Zainab Tepechi, about this. And of course, one of the lessons, one of the takeaways is that unless you embed your mobilizing and organizing, then you wind up, uh, you can wind up creating effects that create circumstances in which those with organization walk away with the goodies. In other words, if you're so focused on this kind of mobilizing activity, but you haven't, I mean, it used to be you had to build networks of relation, of leaders, of, of collective capacity, of strategy, and then you would decide on a mobilization as a tactic or in response to a crisis, but it was strategic. And now too much, it's just tactical. It's like, let's do this, and then we do this, and then what happens? Well, what can happen is that the folks with organization can walk in and pick up all the goodies. And so we really have a responsibility, I think, to, uh, to do that kind of organizing. Now, you know, I don't know, it's really challenging because of course people respond with anger, with uh, outrage, uh, but unless we can create infrastructure to begin to bring the kind of leadership and focus and learning into it, we run the risk of uh, just going backwards again. Ari? Yeah, I mean, just to underscore what Marshall said, um, you know, actually, uh, two stories on this front that I was thinking about as you were talking, Marshall. Um, one is that just yesterday, uh, Marshall, Art, and I were in a meeting, or uh, actually, no, it was Friday, I can't remember. Day before Anyways, yesterday. Um, day before yesterday, um, we were in a meeting where Arisha Hatch, who leads a um, black, um, organizing network in the United States called Color of Change um, was talking about how, you know, if you all think back to um, a few years ago to when Ferguson happened, right, and, you know, people were pouring into the streets at the time, and um, there was all this outrage that was going on, and, you know, she was saying, like, we were getting on every news channel around the world, right, like, people were broadcasting the work that Color of Change and other organizations um, were leading, and they had you know, all this attention, but it wasn't enough to sort of stop 
um, the prosecutor in Missouri from standing up and giving a 45 minute speech for why he wasn't going to bring charges to the police officer, you know? And so she realized at that moment, I think a lesson that sort of underscores a lot of what Marshall's talking about, which in some ways is the difference between attention and power, you know? And like so often we do, we have these large mobilizations and I'll just say from where I sit, like I get all these journalists who call me all the time, every time there's a big mobilization saying, you know, is this going to work? You know, and it's like the conversation is always around the difference between attention and power. You know, just because you have attention doesn't mean you have power. And power yeah. comes through the um, the infrastructure and the leadership and the strategy that Marshall's talking about. And the sort of second story I'll sort of say on that really quickly is, you know, so I have um, I have an 11 year old daughter and a seven year old son, and I remember you know them both coming home from school when they're in elementary school, first learning about the civil rights movement. And the story that they get in a way is like Rosa Parks was this black woman, she was tired, she didn't want to sort of move to the back of the bus, so she sat down in the front, and then they organized this boycott, and then the bus company gave in and they desegregated, you know? And what they miss in that is that the boycott went on for 384 days or something like that, right? It went on for over a year. So it wasn't just one big mass mobilization, it was a mobilization that was sustained at great risk, you know, and great hardship, to the constituents who are part of it. And throughout that time, there are a set of leaders who are constantly negotiating with the bus company, with allies, with media, with all these people about, you know, when do we compromise? When do we not? When do we stand our ground? You know, how do we sort of hold people together? How do we make sure that we sort of provide, you know, continue growing the capacities that we need to sort of sustain this boycott? And I think that's the kind of infrastructure and leadership that we often don't um, recognize as being important in the kind of mobilizing culture that exists around the world. Yeah, no, thanks so much for that, Hari. I think one of the things that uh, is coming up in the chat a little bit with folks is, is, is this question of structure, particularly in moments of, of high mobilization and how we actually create spaces for leadership in those moments of mobilization. I'm going to ask uh, Nisreen, uh, who, who posed a question on the chat, to chime in with her reflection and question. Yes, hi, thank you both, Marshall and Hari. Um, my question is, how do we, or um, what have you learned, or what can you um, both share on building coalitions? I find in moments of um, high mobilization and tension, there are many small organized groups in the street, but they don't manage to build a coalition among them to counter the other huge organized group and often in dictatorships the huge organized groups are very ideological so how can we the small maybe liberal group organized groups work together after the high mobilization is done because when the high mobilization is done we're all in the moment of urgency united working together once it's settled a little bit then our coalition is not as strong. Anything on that? Oh, well, the answer is one, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, I mean, you're articulating one of the major challenges uh, to this. And I think, I think the challenge is made worse by the tendency that a lot of social movement groups have to resist structure, period. Uh, because of having experienced uh, oppressive structures, then uh, sometimes react that we don't want structure or we don't want much structure or we don't think leadership uh, should exist or whatever. And so it makes it much harder to create the kinds of structures through which we can uh, enable. It's kind of, there's a distinction uh, Isaiah Berlin made between freedom from and freedom to it. Like freedom from, we focus on getting out from under some form of oppression. But unless we focus on how to come together to make decisions, strategize, follow up, then we, we don't have the freedom to create the kind of world that we want to create. And so that's an inherent tension that uh, we've been struggling with and others have been struggling with. Uh, and so, and there's another factor that I want to mention, certainly it's a big issue in the United States, is the dependence of uh, organizing groups on donors. Uh, because what that does, it creates a market of competition among groups for donor funds. And so it, it sort of, uh, you know, you want to say, well, the first thing these small groups ought to do is form a union and bargain collectively with the donors in order to begin to leverage some kind of power. 
But I think it reveals uh, a deeper uh, problem, which is that if you don't see your power as being in your people, in your constituency, and building it and strengthening it, and you see your power as coming from funding, then you're never going to build that power. So, I mean, this is a reality that I think, and, you know, international NGOs are probably just as problematic, if not more. And so, I don't know, I, I think you're touching on a, on a major issue here. Um, coalitions can be very problematic for that reason, because to the extent their, their financial support depends on distinguishing themselves from somebody else, they have an investment in sustaining their own identity, in their own leadership, in their own structure. And it undermines the capacity to let go of that, to be able to create structures with the scale and scope necessary to actually exercise power. So, yeah, you, you've identified, Ms. Reno, a very big challenge. I, my own view is that we have to create those large structures that enhance, um, you know, sometimes we think of structure, how can I say, like commonality as reducing our capacity for individual agency. I think the challenge of democratic organization is collectivity that enhances our agency because it enhances our capacity for collective action. And that's the kind of structures I think we need to work on developing. That was a good deflection of it, yes. <laughs> I would, um, I'll just sort of say that um, this question about coalition building is one that comes up all the time in the kind of conversations that I'm having. Um, and one thing that I've been thinking about, I think that relates to what Marshall said is, um, you know, I, I didn't actually know this until recently, but you know, you, usually when we think of the word radical, right, uh, radical generally means ideological, right? Like we, the way it's sort of come to, to um, be used is that we think of it as being sort of extreme on one side or the other. And the root word of radical is, is actually rooted, <laughs> right? So it means to be sort of grounded or rooted in something. And so radical change is extreme change because it's rooted in something. And so I've been thinking about that a lot because um, you know, so often it's like the coalitions that I see that are trying to get created are being created because of some donors pulling people together or, or something like that. And they're not rooted in the kind of relational work that we want our constituents to do. The leaders need to be doing that same thing, you know, and in the sort of coalitions that I've seen that are most effective, it's where you have that, that real rootedness in relationship between the leaders of the organizations and there's an actual exchange of interests and, res uh, you know, of interest and resources, right, in the way that, that we try to teach in, in, in the organizing work. Um, because so often what ends up happening is that in coalitions, the groups that are structurally disadvantaged those same disadvantages would get replicated in the coalitions, right? So the groups that represent the poor constituencies, the constituencies of color, so on and so forth, get disadvantaged in the sort of coalitions themselves, unless you have that rootedness in a relationship that sort of leads to a real exchange of interests, you know, so that each group has its own source of its own power. And that, that power is then sort of put together in ways that sort of in, um, grow and enhance everyone's power, so. Yeah, Just thanks, one thanks a lot. Yeah, go ahead, Marshall. Just one comment on ideology. The, the way the word has come to be used, I think it's, it's. I mean, you know, we always thought in terms of, uh, well, if you, you, have, you need to have a narrative, you need to have the story of why you're doing what you're doing. You need to have strategy, you need to understand power and have an analysis of how in the world you're actually going to develop the power that you need, uh, not just at the first level, but at a deep the structural and institutional level, even if it means starting small. And you have to have a way of structuring what you're doing. Uh, one of the hazards in, in, in formal ideologies has been that every strategic argument becomes an argument about goals or means, as well as, uh, I'm sorry, about ends, as well as means. So it's very hard to have strategic conversation that isn't at the same time a debate about the core values. I think that's problematic. Uh, I think that that we need to understand the importance of that which moves us, which narrative does it is about, but also understanding clear sighted, clear with a clear vision about the power dynamics. Um, and so, I think sometimes ideologies can get in the way of that uh, rather than enhancing it. That's not an argument that we don't need good analysis because we sure as hell do. 
And one of the things we really need to do is enable people to understand power, because uh, frankly, in the United States, that's one of the things that sort of disappeared, certainly in a lot of academic institutions. Yeah, thank you, Hari and Marshall, both for, for your reflections um, on that. One, one kind of quick thing to add uh, that I think I've been reflecting on a lot lately is mo moments of crisis happen. Like they're going to happen in many of our, in, in, in our work in the societies we're working in, the landscapes that we're working in, and whether or not we're working intentionally to build trust and organizing capacity has a whole lot to do with, with our ability to respond in those moments. And then our ability to respond in those moments uh, and, and actually carry some of that work through. Because I, I mean, I know in Michigan right now, we're in a very intense moment where our state legislature is currently working to strip many of the powers from our incoming governor uh, and doing a whole lot of a whole lot of damage. And there's some of the losses that we're going to take on that. A lot of it rests on our ability to kind of reap the 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 kind of benefits and 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 the trust that we built over the past eighteen months of working with a multiracial coalition of folks and knowing that the way that we respond to this fight is going to matter a whole lot for what the long term is. So I know Celine just brought up a point around long term commitment, and I think that's such a that is such a critical one. I'm going to ask. We got about ten minutes left in this conversation. I'm going to ask Juan, who is our chat monitor, to chime in uh, with with kind of giving us a little bit of the pulse on the chat. I know it's been very busy and flying. So Ruan, do you wanna lift up some of the points or questions or reflections that we're seeing on the chat? Yeah, of course. Um, I think you've addressed a lot of these, but the ones, it sound, when I'm looking at the big picture, a lot of people are sharing the challenges that they're having on the ground. So Liz had mentioned, uh, I've been working to identify listening approaches and facilitating training for leaders. It's helped to bring people together across difference to see the value of learning from each other. Um, Frederick was talking about how we've created a strategic plan. However, our tactics have failed to achieve high level of mobilization. So we're concerned with diabetic patients who are dying because they can't afford insulin. There's a small group and it's hard to build a high amount of mobilization around the issue. Democracy often fails to recognize unfortunate minorities. Um, Celine also, as you said, talked a little bit about the challenge of long-term commitment and how there's a desire for immediate change. Um, and then Karen also had mentioned um, about the role of technology. And just coming in, Jesse is asking a question about the balance between full-time organizers of organizations and the role of individuals who are activists. Um, so there's a lot going on in terms of the various challenges people face on the ground in doing this organizing work. Um, and I think it's a good indicator in terms of why a lot of people are mo you know, leaning towards mobilizing rather than organizing. Um, so I'll give you back the floor, Art. Great, yeah, th thanks Rowan for kind of digesting some of that. One, one, one point, the last one that Jesse just hit on that I know Marshall and I had a conversation a on a little bit on Friday that would like to just pose. So when we're talking about how we're actually enabling the leadership for a constituency of people to create change uh, in, a, in a community or in a society, like this, this, this question of uh, kind of the balance between staff and paid organizers and leaders and the role for, for, for activists or leaders on the front line or kind of broadening the leadership within a constituency. Um, so, and Jesse's asking, you know, interested in both Hari's findings and, and Marshall's observations on the balance between some of the roles, roles. And I would add the kind of depth and growth that we can have across a base of people would be very interested to hear y'all's reflections on that. Marshall, you Hari? wanna go? Yeah, you you go. wanna go, Hari? <laughs> you go first. You go first. <laughs> no, you go for it. No, uh, no, no. I think. I mean, you know, change and continuity are in real tension, um, and you know, social movements are trying to bring about change. They operate in a different rhythm. They offer, operate in a different uh, time scale. Uh, they're like uh, Tom Hayden said. Change being, uh, Tom Hayden said, change is slow except when it's fast. Social movements operate in that way. Continuity is about how do we institutionalize, how do we sustain, how do we continue what we built. And both are parts of an organizing process. I mean, they're both parts of it. And the problem often is that the, that the second, the institutionalizing part takes over the, the organizing part and sort of drives it out. And 
we sort of lose our capacity to renew. Or the organizing part never is able to institutionalize in such a way that it can sustain what it's achieved. My point is that there's a tension here that just has to be managed and we have to figure out how to manage it. Now, when it comes to the question of full-time staff and, and things like funding, there's a very good article called Freedom Funders on how the civil rights movement was funded in the United States. And it sort of shows that, first of all, it was self-funded. I mean, people, full-time volunteers, I mean, people who were operating, sort of capitalizing the movement with their own labor uh, because of their depth of commitment. It wasn't that there were never full-time people. There were. But, uh, or maybe they were preachers, or maybe, so I think it's important to be kind of realistic about that. Other funding came from churches and unions whose values were more aligned with the, uh, with the movement. And there was also some very smart ways in which public funds, like for voter registration, were, were figured out how to be used to sustain the movement. Foundations played almost zero role. There were a couple of small foundations that played a role. My point is that, that the period of intense organizing involved in movements is often a highly sacrificial proposition. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's tough to, to, to acknowledge. On the other hand, the idea that you can mobilize without full-time people, um, it doesn't work. I mean, you're mobilizing a lot of stuff, but unless there's people who are really focused on how to make the thing work. See, I think that the, one of the problems I've observed is when people confuse, um, we need to organize, so let's hire a lot of organizers because that way each organizer can get into relationship with 20 people and that way we can mobilize a lot of people. Well, what, th those aren't organizers. Those are mobilizers. Organizer would go out and look for the, develop the leadership that will build the teams, that will build the community, that the base is volunteer engagement because that's, that's not necessarily full-time, but so it's, there's confusion about what it means, what the role of full-time people is, and whether they're actually organizers or they're just paid mobilizers. Uh, it goes back to that early distinction. So I think you need both, and you need these elements of continuity, the elements of change. You need the full-time. You also need the part. I mean, the, the whole point of the full-time is to enable people to exercise their power collectively who are not full-time if that makes sense. Over to Hari. So I agree, um, I agree with Marshall. Um, you know, I, um, I think that when I first started doing research on some of these questions, I kind of went in with the instinct that like, reliance on paid staff is not good, you know, because, um, you know, it's sort of about developing the sort of capacity and commitment of, of people, which I still believe is true. But, but what I realized is, to Marshall's point about the tension between change and continuity, there's not a formulaic answer to this, right? It's sort of like there's a constant tension that has to be worked out. But the bigger issue, um, you know, I, I had this one quote from, um, an, a, a, from a leader that I've done a lot of research with. It's a woman named Doran Schrantz, who leads a state-based organization in Minnesota called Isaiah that a lot of you probably know, who a lot of you probably know. And I remembered her talking about how, you know, what happens in, this, 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 she's describing the sort of um, donor dependent kind of movement world in the United States, but I, I've seen the same phenomenon happen with NGOs across, um, across the world is that, you know, you start doing a little bit of something and then all of a sudden you become like a darling of the funder community or you become a darling of the sort of NGO community. And then all of a sudden all these resources kind of pour in and they fly you around the country and they want you to speak on all these panels. And they want you to talk about all the work that you're doing and how exciting it is. And what ends up happening is that at first, that's really alluring, right? Because you're getting really close to power and you're getting upstream in that power conversation. But then what ends up happening, her, her point was, is that you lose your teeth, right? And the reason you lose your teeth is because you're no longer in relationship with your base, but you're buying them, right? So when you get into the situation where your ability to sort of deliver your base is, is dependent on funders giving you the money to do that as opposed to being an actual relationship with them, then you've lost the very source of power that launched you into this world anyway, right? And then what happens is then, then your power is dependent on your proximity to power as opposed to having your own independent base of power that sits outside that relationship. So you can't challenge it, you know? And so like, 
I mean, I think about it all the time in my own work, you know, because like I'm out trying to like hustle funding for my research and like I, you know, funders want me to come and like talk to things and, like I don't, you know, I have to recognize that like, you know, the power of the work doesn't come from them recognizing it. It comes from the inherent intrinsic value of the work that we're trying to do in the world, you know, the research that we're trying to do in the world. And I think with organizing, like it's, it's not so much the sort of formulate question of staff versus paid staff versus volunteers, but more the extent to which you're in authentic relationship with the base that you can build and what do you need to do to sort of get there and then to sort of navigate those upstream power relationships. It's really good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Hari Marshall, for the reflections on that. So um, there's a lot of really amazing conversation happening uh, in in the in the chat, and we are we're now we're now at time, uh, and I know we need to keep moving the conversation along. There's a lot of really amazing breakout groups that we're going to go into, and we're also going to have an opportunity for us to begin developing some relationships with each other and doing some one-on-ones. Um, so, uh, Hari or Marshall, any kind of last takeaways or thoughts maybe in 20 or 30 seconds and then we're going to wrap the, the, the panel. How are you go first? This time. Well, it's always, I, I've only been able to like barely see in the chat, so I can't, I uh, haven't internalized everything that's in there, but I have a few well, questions. That were oh, um, I sort of saw, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, that I sort of saw a thread of a few questions that were talking about like, well, how do we do the organizing work or how do we do the work of developing leadership when so many people are like anti-leadership or anti-expertise or anti the kind of deep work that organizing requires? And that, that's a huge question and I don't want to take 10 minutes talking about it, but I'll just sort of say that um, two quotes that I always think about, right? One comes from, this is one that, that Marshall talks about all the time, right? But the Jewish theologian Maimonides, right, who said, um, hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable, right? And if we give in to the sort of anti-leadership mobilizing only conversation that's out there, you're making the probable necess the, the necessary, right? You're making that a reality as opposed to sort of pointing to ways that we can create a new future. Um, and the sort of second thing that I was thinking about there is the reason I became a political scientist was because I remember reading, you know, James Madison in the Federalist Papers, and he wrote, you know, what is democracy but the greatest of all reflections on human nature, right? And if men were angels, no government would be necessary, right? And the idea is that the core of democracy is this idea that we need to create institutions that help us become our better selves, right? That help us in create the kind of collective capacities that we want. And that's through our politics that we realize, you know, the full breadth of our humanity. And so I just feel like that sort of, that hopefulness that's contained in the democratic promises is important to remember as we struggle against these things. Well, there's very little I could add to that. I, I do want to just underscore one thing. Thanks to the benefits of technology, we're having this conversation. So I think it's very important not to see technology as the enemy of what we're trying to do, but rather mechanisms that we need to harness to what we're trying to do. And I think as is often the case, new technologies are the, the first to benefit are those with the most resources to get access to them and use them. And I think we have a challenge to take it in a different direction uh, because this, this need to create collective capacity locally, nationally, internationally, that's crucial to our, our creating the foundation for a world in which we want to live and want our children to live. And I think that the, the kind of communication we're having right now is pretty cool and pretty potent and has a lot of potential. So I think we sort of have to look at how to use the, whatever tools we have to build the kind of community we have and do the kind of learning that we need to do to go forward. Uh, so um, yeah, I just look forward to uh, continuing to learn with everyone here. Right. Thank you, Hari. Thank you, Marshall. Um, I'm gonna, Marshall taught us a little trick earlier that maybe we can build upon and unmute and give a little bit of a, a round of applause to our panel, to Hari and Marshall for leading us through this first one. Oh, uh, thank, thank you all so much for, for a very rich discussion. Obviously, this is just the very tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more depth that we can dive into and certainly one of the important parts of why a community like this globally of people that are really working 
uh, to strengthen their capacity and practice to organize, to lead, and to create change in their communities is really critical. So thank you all for the conversation. Uh, much more to go, and I'm going to kick it back over to Anna, uh, who is going to lead us into the Thank you. Thank you, Art, so much. Uh, and thank you, Harry and Marshall, for uh, this great discussion. Thank you, everyone, also for a very lively chat, chat, chat conversation. Uh, we already know that we are going to use it for, as a base for, um, you know, like the coming events uh, and everything, um, and the future discussions that we're going to have in the future. This is just, uh, as uh, Art said, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but the good news is that we are just relaunching. So there will be plenty of opportunities uh, uh, for discussions like like this uh, in the future. Now, let me uh, introduce our dear Art, uh, 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 sorry, Rowan Zane, uh, who is our um, community builder. That's how we call it internally. Uh, but externally, her role is actually membership engagement uh, and community of practice manager. Uh, and she will be actually talking a little bit about what's coming in terms of the LCN uh, and what is it we are trying to build with our community of practice. Um, so Rowan, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, thanks, everyone. It's been really uh, exciting listening and um, reading the chat with everybody. There's so much rich learning, and this is only an indicator of all the rich conversations we're going to be having uh, in the years to come. So as Anna said, I am uh, the Membership Engagement and Community of Practice Manager, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the community of practice and what activities you might expect from us. At, here at the LCN, um, as well as how to become a member. But before we do that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what caused me to this work. Um, Anna, can you share your screen, please? Um, so you see, I was born in Jordan, um, but my dad used to work for Pepsi. So at the age of eight, we started moving around. And I remember in sixth grade, we had just moved to Jordan, and I was attending the American school there. And one day the gym teacher announces that there's a new boy on campus and he'll be joining our class. Um, Munir walked in, scrawny, curly, uh, brown hair, looking really nervous. And the teacher continued the class and announced that we're going to be square dancing. Very strange, it's square, square dancing in Jordan, but that's okay. Um, and um, the girl, and so she asked the girls to pick the boys to be their dancing partners. So the girls quickly started selecting people, and I noticed that no one was selecting the new boy. So I figured this was just a, I figured it was because of a rumor on campus that he had a skin condition that made his arms so dry they looked scary. I watched him all alone and looking nervous, and I remembered myself. I remembered when we first moved to Cyprus, and I didn't speak English very well. And one day I turned, to, uh, turned around in class and asked a boy to pass me the rubber. And everybody started laughing at me. What is the rubber? I didn't know that rubber was, that eraser was the American version of the word. I was so embarrassed. I sunk in my chair, holding back the tears and wanting to disappear. And I did. I kept for myself until one day, two American twin sisters, Ariel and Ashley, approached me and asked me to play with them. We started playing during recess and lunch and eventually we had play dates. And when we moved from Cyprus to Egypt, I never thought I would ever miss Cyprus, but because of them, because of the community I had started to build there, it started to feel like home. So there I was seeing myself in this new boy. So I gathered up the courage and started walking towards him, knowing the gossip that may ensue. I asked him to dance. He accepted as we do -si do together, laughing and smiling, and we eventually became friends. We continued moving around, and I had people who welcomed me, and at times I welcomed people. But when I was 27, I decided to move back to Jordan and all my friends from sixth grade were gone. And I had never felt so alone, as you can see from the picture. <laughs> um, the one place that was supposed to be home was the one place I could never connect with people. Depressed, I decided to try something new and take art lessons. And there I met an artist who welcomed everybody into his home. And although he didn't speak English very well, he accepted my broken Arabic and we would talk about philosophy, psychology, and the arts. And I started to meet his friends, all of whom were Jordanian leftists, writers, artists, performers. And despite not growing up in Jordan, despite my socioeconomic class and my culture, they accepted me. And we would sing around the fireplace and sing leftist and nationalist songs. And then I finally felt Jordan was becoming like my home. 
I later started an NGO called Talila, where local communities create spaces for their communities to express themselves, local teams, uh, create communities um, for the local community to express themselves, learn and witness one another, and experience their community in a positive, positive light. And it became a place for social cohesion. And when I was starting, I had, uh, Nasreen Hajj, I had met Nasreen Hajj Ahmed, who told me about Marshall's organizing class. And she sat with me and introduced me to the whole world of community organizing. And so I took the class, and I was lucky enough that Nasreen Hajj Ahmed created Mujtama'i in Ahad, uh, a community that brought Arab organizers together. So after I took this transformative class, there was a place for me to come and continue my learning. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Can you change, can you change the slide, please? Um, yes. So, and that's where I also discovered the Leading Change Network. And I got to meet all these amazing organizers from around the world. And we can continue growing not only in Jordan, um, but also learning from people all around the world. And so that's why I'm called to be um, the membership engagement and community of practice uh, manager. So now let me tell you a little bit about the community of practice um, um, program. So at its core, the Leading Change Network is a member-led organization. We are member-led um, because we believe in relationships, because we believe in building leadership of our community. And we do that by putting you, our members, at the center of our work. As we talked about just now with Hari and, and Marshall, relationship is the center of this, and, our, and so is our community. So we uh, also hold these, ourselves accountable to our members, making sure that these programs and projects are relevant to your needs. And we also make our programs participatory, meaning that we want to engage you in the network. So we'll not just be providing services of events um, and, and discussions, but instead, we want to work with you, our members, to figure out what the challenges you face and how we can use this community that we're building to learn from one another and to see how we can address it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to be member-centered, relationship building is the key. So that means we aim to build relationships with our members through our websites as well as through one-on-ones. So when you become a member, you will be getting an email from me asking you for a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I would love to learn about you, your experience, um, and how you can learn from people and how other people can learn from you. And this way, I can connect you with other um, members who are interested in the same topics and find ways in which we can build teams that will address certain issues that we're facing. Um, it's also, um, we also have a website where you, when you become a member, you fill in this profile, and it's very important that you fill in your profile with full detail because this is a way for us to connect um, with one another. So we will also be doing live events throughout the year um, so members can get to know one another. Um, so here we're going to ask our members to take the leadership. And for example, if they're in New York um, and they'd like to see who are some of the, to meet the LCN members in person in 3D, um, they would be holding these events. Um, also, um, your experience is going to be our greatest resource for learning to improve or our organizing practice. So our community of practice is a place for us to share experiences and learn from one another. And we do that um, through two distinct programs. So one is going to be the LCN-led events and the other is going to be the member-led events. Um, so our member-led events will be showcasing our members' campaigns, bringing in panel discussions and guest speakers, as well as having focus sessions around leadership and organizing. Um, so, if you, so if you visit our website, you can nominate people that you would recommend for us to recruit to come and speak to our community. Our LCN-led events will be projects led by our members. Um, these members could be live meetups, like I said, if someone in New York would like to hold an event. Another project are deep dive sessions, where members can recommend a series of meetings to dig deeper into a leadership practice. So for example, Art Rios, who just met, and Wing Doan want to hold two sessions on how to address race and privilege in trainings. Um, another member, uh, Peja, is interested in holding uh, a session in terms of how to incorporate organizing in large bureaucratic and historical organizations. The third type of projects are caucus-led projects. 
sorry, hold on, um, to discuss um, something specific in their field. So it could be people who are working in the, members who are working in the environment can connect with other environmental activists and organizers. Or if you, it could also be a caucus in terms of location. So in Europe, what people are doing. Um, so you would come with a recommendation and we would work with you to build a team and see how we can reach as many people and engage them as much as possible in these discussions. So what type of topics are you expecting, uh, can you expect from 2019? So our topics are gonna be um, skill-based, practice-based, as well as theory. And so here are just a couple of themes that we're going to be talking about. So uh, one of our first um, member-led projects is going to be by Wing and Art on managing race and privilege in trainings. Um, I know that Nasreen had, uh, from Ahel had recommended doing sessions about innovation and new ideas for community organizing trainings. There is also in public narrative, we were, we're going to invite um, Sarah Rahab to come and talk to us about her work with mayors and the great and how she's been using narrative um, with them, as well as having sessions that would dig deeper in public narrative on topics of loss, change, difference, and power. Um, we're also gonna have campaigns about sessions, uh, about campaigns, um, and how to, for example, how to run a strategy story um, and start story strategy and structure session to launch a campaign, as well as talking about how to maximize the database. Um, so that's kind of what you can expect from us for the year to come. A lot of rich topics, a lot more conversation. Um, so how can you join the network? You can join um, by becoming a member on our website. To be eligible to become a member, you need to have been trained either in a workshop or a class in the LCN pedagogy. Our membership fees are around $100 a year, and right now we have an early bird registration fee of 75. And we will also provide scholarships to ensure that money will not be a barrier for people to join us. So what are the benefits of being a member? Access to our member-only online community. So you'll be able to find, connect, and learn among peers from different cultures and geographies. You can ask for advice, share resources, and participate in discussions. You have free access to our resource center. Uh, we have invitations to local member events, and we also have various um, discounts for certain events that we're going to hold. Um, so what are the membership types? So there's the individual membership is for those individuals who are familiar with our organizing pedagogy um, in terms of practicing those who are practicing it on the ground or want to improve and deepen their learning. There's also group membership is for organizations who are familiar with the pedagogy and they want to learn and practice more and want their members to get their support and learning. And then lastly, we have our affiliates. So affiliates are organizations that have adopted the LCN uh, pedagogy as their main theory of change and are implementing it in all aspects of their work. Affiliates might use the pedagogy for making a campaign on the ground, um, for supporting other organizations and individuals, or by installing organizing principles. Now, if you are not eligible for membership, do not despair. We still want you to be part of the uh, Leading Change Network. So uh, we have subscriptions. So sub subscriptions are open to everyone. You'll be open, it will um, be on the mailing list. You'll get updates on all our events. And some events will be open for non-members for a small fee. And we'll also be announcing opportunities of trainings so that you might become eligible to become a member. So that's a lot of information in 10 minutes. Um, now, as to model the community of practice work that we're going to be doing, we have created four different breakout rooms. These sessions or these breakout rooms uh, are gonna have panel discussions around topics of public narrative, ones about how to build organizations um, that use organizing, a third is about campaigning and how to scale. And then the fourth is how to teach organizing. Um, so um, Matt is going to put us all in different breakout rooms and you'll have a monitor who will introduce the session and you'll have the panelists to speak and we will continue having our rich learning discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to introduce Matt, uh, who will be uh, telling us a little more about our new website um, and how actually uh, it can be used as a platform for uh, building the, the relationships and also st uh, uh, first step in creating uh, all these conversations. So um, Matt is, as I said, our tech and communication manager. Uh, and Matt, please go ahead. The floor is yours.
Thanks, Thanks. Anna. Um, so yeah, so I'm LCN's uh, Tech and Communications Manager. Really excited to be a part of this relaunch. And before I share our new website, uh, which we're all very excited about, and I hope you are as well, um, I just wanted to share a little bit more about my own story of how I got involved with organizing and what brought me to this community. Um, so I actually grew up in a small town in Missouri, in America's Midwest. I had an older brother, uh, my parents raised us um, Catholic, so we went to church once a week. Um, and my dad actually worked at a boarding school. And I remember one Thanksgiving, he invited a student who couldn't make it home um, to the holiday to spend Thanksgiving with us. Um, and I was told um, by my parents that the student would be staying in my room um, because I had a, a bunk bed. Um, but at the time, you know, I was a young kid, um, younger brother, um, not very excited about the prospect of sharing my room with a stranger. Um, so I asked my parents, why do I need to do this? Um, you know, I'd just gotten my own room. And then my parents reminded me about um, the golden rule that I'd learned about in church, you know, to treat others um, how I wanted to be treated. Um, so I begrudgingly agreed, um, you know, to share my room with a student. And on Thanksgiving, uh, we all sat around the table and passing around plates of ham and potatoes and my mom's favorite stuffed mushrooms. Um, and my dad asked us to go around and say one thing that we we're thankful for. And when it got to the student's turn, he said how thankful he was uh, to have a family to share a Thanksgiving dinner with. And it made me feel really bad about earlier not wanting to share a room with him um, and much better about actually sharing that holiday with him. And many years later, Hurricane Katrina hit the Southern US. And like so many others, I was drawn to the news coverage and I was reminded by the golden rule and, and really felt the need to do something to help others. And I heard about a clothing drive in my school, so I got involved with that. I rounded up all of my favorite clothes and attached handwritten notes on them. And you know, the clothing drive ended, but the news coverage continued, um, as did my own education into inequality. And as I learned more, a clothing drive just didn't seem like a big enough solution to deal with such a big problem. Um, so I searched for other ways to make a difference. And finally, I came across a campaign uh, with a different model. Uh, they were actually looking for volunteers to start local groups and get people involved um, to build the power needed to pass laws to combat inequality. Um, so I looked at groups in my state, and there was only one. <laughs> one group in a state of uh, over 5 million people. It just didn't seem um, like a big enough effort to really make an impact on, on such a big issue. Um, so I decided to start my own group. Um, and that was the beginning of my learning journey uh, into organizing. And that's a journey that's continued the last 14 years as I've organized for change in communities around the world. And I'm very excited to continue that journey um, now with the LCN community um, with a focus on sharing the stories of organizing efforts from LCN members around the world. Because I really believe that by doing that, we can help more people who are searching for a way to make a difference um, to start their own learning journey into the power of organizing. Um, so that's a little bit about me, and now I'm just going to do a quick screen share and show you our new website. So this is our website. Um, this is the view uh, that everyone will see when they go there, the public view. So you'll see, you know, the typical um, things you might find in a website, news and events. Um, but the exciting thing really is that this website is built around our membership program. Um, so, you know, the first thing you'll be prompted to do is actually sign up to become a member. Um, it gives you a little bit more information about what the membership program offers and the requirements to join. Um, and then you can actually fill in the form um, to register as a member, um, as an individual or as a group. Once you've um, become a member, you can actually sign in and see a few um, extra um, parts to the website, which is pretty cool. Um, so the first thing you'll see are actually our program areas. So we have a page for our learning organizing program where you can see any upcoming courses. So we have the leadership organizing and action course that's coming up. The next program, uh, program page you'll see is actually our community of practice. And this is a great opportunity for you to um, let us know about, you know, inspiring people and campaigns and new research um, that we can help highlight and help share the story about. Um, this is also the place where you can suggest a session. So if there's an issue that you would like to lead a session on or you're interested in hearing more from the community about, you can do that. And our last program page is actually our building capacity page. So this is where you can actually reach out to us 
um, and request, you know, a training or a coaching, and we can get you connected with um, one of the coaches um, in LCN's network. So I just want to show you what the actual um, profile page of a member looks like now as well. So you can see here um, Ben's page. Um, so information um, and actually an ability to um, contact. So this is how you can actually connect with um, other organizers, educators, and researchers around the world. And you can connect around, you know, interests um, or location or both. Um, so this is what a profile page looks like. Um, you can also put in um, projects that you're working on um, and start discussions um, to um, communicate and connect and share with, with others in the community. Um, so if you're searching for someone else, um, if you just click on the members page here, um, you'll see all of the members um, in the community and you can search for them by name, location, um, or as I said, by interests. Um, so pretty exciting. Um, and let's see, the one other thing I wanted to show is the learning resources. So this is something that um, some of you have had access to over the years um, in Google Drive. Um, we now have a page for it on the member site where you can get access to a growing library of resources, which is quite exciting. Um, so this is a case study as an example. Um, yeah, so I think those are the main things. All right, I will turn it back over to Anna. Thank you, Matt, so much. I'm just wondering, since we have a little moment there, uh, and thank you for doing actually uh, the presentation in less than plain time. Uh, I was just wondering if you want to show how uh, you can actually search members by interest. Uh, just, you know, like how the map will shift and um, all that. If you can do that quickly, of course. Yep, yeah, let me just open it up here. So here's the map again. So yeah, we can do a quick search by um, location if we wanna find someone um, in Australia, for example. Search the map and find an individual organization. Um, we can also search by interest. Mm -hmm. So if we wanna find someone else who's like organizing around health issues, for example, um, you can use that to search um, through our community um, and actually to um, be able to find people who are um, organizing around health issues, um, see the other issues that they're involved with and actually reach out, connect and send them a message. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Matt. Well, I hope everyone is excited about our new website uh, as much as we are. Uh, I think <laughs> I think also uh, one important thing to mention here is, uh, yeah, there is a public side of the website and the one that is for members only um, and really we hope uh, it's gonna become the the starting point obviously for uh, the the for our community to come together and to exchange views and you know like what they are working on um, as Matt said like people can add their event uh, discussion or or a project um, and of course we'll base our network on and community on one-on-one uh, -on -one and relationship building and in person or online but uh, still real-time uh, events and activities uh, but it's just to help us facilitate that process so thank you Matt once again for sharing it okay so can I just have um, a few pluses out loud, a uh, few deltas, uh, and a few key learnings, um, and we should wrap up with that. Um, and I see Jake is smiling, so maybe Jake, you can get us started and model uh, how the deviation looks, and then I'll, I would invite someone else to raise hand and to share with us. Sure, that's a lot of pressure, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> no, plus, I mean, it, just wonderful, wonderful to be on this event and to see all these familiar faces, but also new faces. Um, in, the community, in the community, I'm speaking Spanish still because I just finished a workshop in Spanish. Um, the, the opportunity to connect with people one-on-one -on -one was really, really helpful. Or in, in my case, we actually end up in a, in a larger group, but the adaptability of that, um, that was very helpful. The, the Delta was, for, for me in particular, I wasn't able to have a one-on-one -on -one with someone, and so I missed that, that opportunity. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone else that want to who want to share out loud? Um, hand raised, if you are willing. Marshall has his hand raised. Yeah. Uh, oh, I didn't see it. Marshall, go ahead. 
You just need to unmute yourself yeah. first. No, no, I, I thought the technology worked beautifully. I thought this was really terrific. And uh, yeah, it was great to see everyone and just congratulations on this relaunch. It's really, it's inspiring. Thank you so much, Marshall. Uh, we appreciate it. And it means a lot when it comes to you, knowing how much experience you have both in uh, online and underground uh, stuff like this. Um, okay, so everyone, thank you once again for joining our kickoff event. As you know, this is just the first week um, and we are actually, as of tomorrow, we will take a little uh, deep breath to uh, evaluate and of course um, see what we've done but then we are going to continue building towards our next week um, so um, please join us uh, you if you haven't seen our new website please go ahead and uh, start using it uh, apply for membership we are definitely want you to uh, in our community uh, and we uh, of course want you to become full-fledged member uh, and then uh, stay uh, connected so we will uh, inform you when the recording is up uh, and of course when our next event comes uh, thank you everyone and i see that marshall is ready for the organizing applause uh, and we should definitely try it out. <laughs> oh, I have I a have proposal. reference we should try to have one person really applauding and everyone else applauding by being muted so it looks like that and it sounds organized. but we'll practice um, okay thank you everyone um, a really pleasure uh, launching this event with you and uh, and the organization and looking forward to seeing you in all our next steps see you soon <laughs>